so uh, I'm Owen Taylor and this is Don McCann. We both work uh, at Red Hat in the uh, desktop engineering team in Westford. Um, so we're going to talk about GNOME 3, which is the new, new major version of GNOME that we released the 3.0 of um, on April 6th, so just a few weeks ago. Um, but in order to get to GNOME 3, I want to start off by talking a bit about the history of GNOME, how we got to this point. Um, so, so, you know, I mean, I expect almost everybody here has used GNOME. You know, sometimes, you know, GNOME is, um, GNOME 2 is what's running on most versions of the 1, 2. It's what, um, you know, it's obviously a very common um, operating system. You know, to say the obvious, GNOME is a uh, um, graphical user interface for Linux. Um, when I actually talk to my friends about it, I, will, I often have to explain it basically as an operating system. Because if you have somebody who's not technically savvy, everything that they see, that's either, either an application or it's coming from the uh, desktop environment. You know, all the, um, how they, the configuration <laughs> tools, the ways you would move windows around, so everything on their screen, you know, is, um, is typically for when you're running GNOME as part of GNOME. So, you know, it's, it's, it is that user's little part there. Um, so GNOME um, is a very, as well as being a user environment, is a big community project. Um, there are over a thousand people with commit access to the GNOME repositories. It's very international. We have committers all over the world. Uh, we're um, GNOME. The translations of GNOME are done by the community, and with GNOME three, we released with over fifty official translations. And uh, you know, there are thousands of commits going into the GNOME repositories every month. It's a big project. Um, it started out in 1997. So, um, 1997, um, a couple of university students in Mexico said. Hey, you know, Linux, you know, should be more accessible. It shouldn't be all about editing your config files to make FEWM the way you want it to be. It should be um, you know, something that people can use on the same uh, sort of level as other operating systems. Now, clearly, GNOME wasn't the only game in town. Uh, about the same time, KD was founded. Um, so, you know, there were some technical and philosophical differences at the beginning there, but, you know, we've basically coexisted pretty productively uh, since then. Um, so, um, so pretty soon after um, GNOME was founded, to bring Red Hat to the story, Red Hat um, was uh, looked at you know, and said, okay, this is pretty interesting. We, we do want our operating system to be accessible to a broader range of people. So Red Hat hired a team of developers to work on, uh, on GNOME. I was actually one of those developers, so that was, I felt it was pretty lucky at that time. There really w weren't a lot of people doing open source, free software for, yeah, as a full-time job. I thought, okay, this is really great that I can do this, and currently I've stuck for quite a while working on GNOME at Red Hat. Um, and when we so we got there, and this was something that had been started in 1997, we really, you know, just from scratch, so it was, so we just really had to work really hard to get something up and out. And so in March 1999, we released GNOME 1.0. It's not the greatest screenshot. I was trying to get screenshots of old versions, but it turns out it's pretty hard to get it. Um, Red Hat 6 <coughs> running on a, in a virtual machine at this point, so I had to find a random screenshot from the internet. But um, it gives you basically the idea of what um, GNOME 1 looks like. Uh, you know, it, it was pretty, had all the basic functionality there. You could manage files, you could um, run your applications and all that. Um, it was, <coughs> you know, to the modern eye, pretty ugly. We had some neat effects going on where with like these stone textured tiles. And uh, you know, some other you know, it was not very pretty, and also technically it was pretty much thrown together. So really, the, the next thing we did after GNOME One O, we went spent a couple of years rewriting a lot of the technical foundations of GNOME to be um, smoother, to be more technically solid, to uh, and and also to make things prettier. Like we between GNOME One O and uh, after GNOME One O, we added entirely the fonts, which was sort of you know everybody expected, but wasn't really there. So in 2002, we released uh, GNOME 2.0. Um, no, so this is a better screenshot because I was actually able to get um, GNOME from 2002 running in a VM. So, um, and I mean, I th again, it, the functionality really wasn't a lot different from GNOME 1.0. Still, I mean, all the basic tasks of a desktop environment haven't really changed. So they're still managing files, they're still launching applications, still switching between windows. But you know it was 
you know, we started to improve our visual story, and it also um, was a lot better technically. It was really a good base to start from and develop on from there. So after GNOME 2.0, we just went ahead and, um, you know, did a lot more releases. So we did, you know, 2.2, 2.4, 2.6, 2.8. And so forth. I think this is about to go to 10. Um, and it, you know, it looks pretty similar to the initial version. You know, then, you know, in another few another few years, okay, we switched to having a top panel and a bottom panel instead of just a bottom panel. And so that kept, you know, more versions. And, you know, this is 2008. It doesn't look a whole lot different from some of the early versions. Now, there was a lot of stuff going on. I, I don't want to give you the impression that we. You just moved uh, around the fonts and changed icons for eight years. A lot of this was uh, in the um, sort of underlying areas. We added a support for a lot more hardware stuff. For instance, um, we added a support for Bluetooth devices. We greatly improved the net networking support. We, um, uh, you know, added better support for laptop screen configuration. All the stuff was going on there, and we also added some more applications, like things like uh, Media Player and all that. So there was a lot of there was a lot of capability increase, but basically the uh, in terms of UI ideas, we had sort of hit a dead end. So the in 2008 we were saying, okay, what do we do to get the ideas for the next version of GNOME? So what we decided to do was to have a, a hack fest to get together user interface designers and programmers from all over the GNOME community and just brainstorm on the next version of GNOME. So we actually did this at the Nobel offices just a few blocks from here sat down in a room for a week and came up with a lot of sketches and ideas. And I think John's going to turn over now to talk with so John can talk about sort of what her ideas are coming up with then. As Owen said, hi, I'm John McCann. I've been working on GNOME for about eight years. So if I can go back to that last slide in a second. So I started in here just shortly after GNOME 2. Uh, so I've been around for a while and been able to see this this progression, this sort of evolutionary process through uh, the GNOME 2 cycle. Um, I think this sort of sums it up, right? So we have this user experience that a lot of people are happy with. It's very good. It's on a lot of your desktops. I saw a lot of Ubuntu machines. Those are most of them GNOME 2. Um, it's built on a very stable, very rock solid foundation. Um, you know, everyone here loves Linux. It's great. We build on top of that. We have something that is extraordinarily good. Could um, you talk a little louder? Some of us <coughs> yeah, are sorry, getting I'll old ears. <laughs> I will. I'll try. <laughs> a little bit allergic today. Sorry. Um, so what we have is, is something that I consider very good and something a lot of us are happy with. However, I think what we're really trying to do is get to the great level, to sort of cross the divide um, to, to, to greatness, to something that can achieve a lot more. And apart from all the sort of technical things and user interface things we've learned along the last 10 years, um, I think in some sense more than any specific failure in technology or in design, we've sort of had a failure to communicate. And, you know, we haven't really been telling a great story about what Linux can do, how it can help people, how we can, you know, use free software to for betterment of mankind and just for a better experience for ourselves. Um, we haven't really been able to sell it to the rest of the world. You know, we're still at a very small percentage of the market compared to everybody else. Even you know, newer players like Android and Chrome OS. And so I mentioned that, you know, as as we all know, we're built on a very high quality foundation. But I think this is sort of been one of the mantras of, of our GNOME 3 development, is quality isn't enough. It's really not. Um, and what, everyone's over 18, right? <laughs> <laughs> We're supposed to be doing slides at a, a Red Hat conference in a month or so. And uh, they don't want me to show this, but I can show it to you guys. <laughs> um, quality isn't job one. Being totally fucking amazing is job one. And that's really what we want to be. We want everybody in here to feel like they're part of that. We want to be something to believe in. You know, we're all here because of the same sort of thing. We all have this sort of belief in what we're doing is valuable and worthwhile. Um, 
And I think we want to sort of spread that to the rest of the world. It also is something that's very important for, for motivating ourselves to do better. And um, what sort of happened in the GNOME 2 cycle is we, you know, you saw through those screenshots that things had stagnated a little bit. And we just wanted to sort of kickstart the project and be a little bit more inspiring, to be a little bit um, more innovative. And not just inspiring ourselves, but in sort of inspiring the world, sort of carrying a torch for free software and open source, um, being able to um, bring new people, new blood, new energy into the community, and also just to um, excite us and be able to excite others. And one big part of sort of reaching other people, people that aren't in this room, people that we talk to all the time that don't know what GNOME is, they don't know what free software is, one really great way to reach them is be beautiful, right? I mean, that's, I certainly want to, I enjoy using beautiful things. I like being around beautiful things. Um, it's sort of a universal quality. And it's something we always, we haven't really spent enough time on, in my opinion. Another thing we wanted to improve was sort of coherency of the product. Um, as Owen said, you know, even, even as far back as GNOME 1, things were just it was so fast-paced and things were sort of chaotic and just sort of threw things together as fast as we could. And we took many, many years in GNOME 2 to build things up more um, with a better foundation, build things up underneath the covers, so to speak, um, in a more coherent way. But we really didn't take the time to address the user interface parts. Um, everything working together in concert, the bits and pieces, different modules from different parts of the world, different maintainers, different projects, all coming together. It sort of was a bit of a stew. It didn't sort of blend. And we want to work on that. Another thing that operating systems and computers and technology in general sort of fails at is being respectful of us, of how we want to spend our time, how we want to use our attention, we're you know, constantly bombarded with messages and emails and chats and even things from the computer. The computer tries to talk to us a lot. You have updates, you have this, you have that. That's not really very respectful. We really want to improve that. And this sort of goes back a little bit to the inspirational part, is we really would like something that we can call our own, to have a single sort of project, a single product. And we really haven't had products in open source. There's a big difference between a project and a product. A product is a thing. It is something that is built as a single entity. And it's something you can sort of believe in. A brand, if you will. I mean, everybody knows that Apple has a very strong brand. People feel part of that tribe, if you will. Um, I think we can do similar things in open source. And so, as Owen said, we, we took the time in 2008 to sort of step back, to sort of reflect on the development of GNOME. Um, but at the same time, we, we sort of reflected on the development of desktop computing, of open source, of technology in general. And so a lot of what we've learned in the last 10 years um, is interesting. But there's also a lot of interesting stuff we can learn from, say, the, even the 1970s. If you go back and you look at the stuff that was done at Xerox Park, um, there's a really, a really great paper that was published by um, Deutsch and Paff in 1980 that has actually informed a lot of our work in GNOME 3. And I think we sort of lost a lot of that innovative design that came out of the 1970s through the 80s and 90s. I think we just sort of stagnated. If you look at the, the Xerox, um, uh, which one was the Star even, and the Apple Macintosh, Windows 2000, Microsoft's Windows 7, or, or, or even you know OS 10 um, that's coming out this summer. There's not a lot of change. There's not a lot of development. There's not a lot of innovation. And I think that's one thing we wanted to try to address. I forget what my transition. So this, this all too started in October of 2008. Um, it, 
was just down the street, as Owen said. And we got a bunch of designers and developers together from all across the world, from many different companies. And we started sort of plotting and in, in ideating and thinking about what we wanted to do, what we wanted to achieve. And that's sort of a neat thing, and it's not something we often do in open source, is that sort of planning and thinking ahead. And we spent a week coming up with a sort of game plan, sort of a list of goals that we wanted to, to try to meet, and put together, you know, some <coughs> concrete mock-ups during that time. And I think it took Owen, what, two days to come up with uh, at least a sketch of how he, how he could do that. I think it's pretty cool. Um, so maybe I should throw it back to you. Okay. Yeah. Is that the right place? Yeah, it's the right place. I forget what we transitioned. <laughs> <laughs> About that, or okay. I think close enough. I may have. I may have. Well. Yeah, I think we got. It. All right. So okay. So so yeah. So we came out of this hack fest in 2008. And we said okay, with a lot of really cool ideas from the designers, both at this sort of very high level, and also the idea of where I'm actually having some mock-ups of things we wanted to do. Um, and you know, I was sitting there as more of a coder and saying, okay, how do we get this, move this forward? How do we actually um, um, you know, start progress on that? And you know, <coughs> we also wanted to really actually get something that's actively going and try to get implemented. So um, we um, started a small team at Red Hat of about four or five people to work specifically implementing these ideas. Um, and of course, the first thing we had to do when we started implementing was knowing what were we building. Because I mean, you can have some ideas about you want to be coherent, you want to be beautiful, but that doesn't really help you when you go to the keyboard to write some code. So um, I want to talk just a little bit about some of the basic technical ideas that we did come up with then, which have carried through the GNOME free uh, process. Um, so, so one of the things was we wanted to have for things to be um, coherent, for all the interactions to work very smoothly with each other. Um, now in GNOME 2, it's very modular. There's lots of different processes, lots of different separately developed modules that all talk to each other. You have your window manager, you have a different component, the GNOME panel, which is about launching applications. You have another component to just display notifications. And any time that you want to change how they work, you have to develop a protocol for this component to talk to this component. And that really means that you just don't get a lot of interactions quite right. So a simple example of this is I think we've mostly had the experience where you have an application running, but you've gotten, you haven't minimized or something. So you go to launch the application again, and then get two copies of the application, and then you're confused about what's going on there. Um, you know, we thought, okay, when somebody clicks on an application launcher to start it again, you should just, if it's already running, you should just bring the windows to the front. So that's an uh, interaction we have between the window manager and the application la launcher. Yeah. Well, if you want to have copies of the application. Well, that's something that we, you know, you have to accommodate, and we have ways of doing that, but it's not like the first thing you want to okay. do. Like, you want a separate way of doing uh, multiple copies if you want them. So, um, so that so is one of uh, interaction, but there actually are thousands of these interactions. All of these just have to work together. So it, we said, okay, well, in GNOME 3, what if we try to unify this more? What if we create... Um, a single process, a single developed module that really handles all this top-level user interaction, called the Udom shell. So that handles all the window management, all the application launching. It, it also is actually the uh, compositing manager, like um, if you're familiar with Compiz, or so it's doing a lot of this. Everything that sort of touches the user directly goes through Udom shell. Um, so you know, technically, Udom shell, you know, it's obviously because it's handling everything, it's a little somewhat complicated piece of code. But we had a couple of basic principles that sort of guided how we um, went about creating it. One thing was that we really wanted our design, our development process to be very driven by by design, to be able to work from a mock-up from a designer and say, okay, we want to make it look like this. We also wanted to be able to very quickly prototype and make changes. So we didn't want to, you know, if we wanted to just say, okay, what if we try it this way, what if we try it that way? We wanted that to be very lightweight. So uh, we, at the top level, most of the logic in GNOME shell, all the, the stuff that says what happens when you click on this launcher, what happens when you, um, the user drags here, is handled, uh, written in JavaScript, and the display is configured using CSS. So these very familiar technologies from the web are actually what we use to develop the shell. And I you know this has worked out pretty well. I mean, because we're using CSS, when our designers you know, have some visual tweak they want to make, they can tell us, okay, tweak this, but also because they, like most designers, have done web stuff, they sometimes can just say, 
okay, I tried changing the existing the code, and this works, and this didn't work. So I think so. That's really the top level. Um, we have a bunch of, of logic in the middle that actually handles a lot of the sort of low-level details of um, interaction with applications. But I mean, I think more interestingly is the stuff at the bottom. So the other thing that John mentioned was that we wanted to be beautiful. We really wanted to be able to take advantage of a lot of the capabilities of modern hardware to be able to do animations, to be able to make things transparent. Now this isn't just to be beautiful. A lot of the stuff actually has a purpose as well. If you make something, um, you have an animation from start A to say B, that really explains to the user what went on. It doesn't just blink from place to place. If we add a little bit of transparency, that can give the user more context. In general, by adding this kind of effects, we're making the desktop more physical, feel like more like a thing and less like a bunch of pixels on the screen. So, so we wanted to really use the capabilities of the modern hardware, which really meant using the 3D engine of the, that hardware. Because if you, the modern GPU is about 99% the 3D engine, and then they have a tiny little bit of silicon in there, which is compatibility for like Windows XP, which is the 2D engine. Um, and you know, previous, you know, most, like GNOME 2 was basically using that 1% of the silicon and growing the rest. So we wanted to write to the 3D API, which meant using OpenGL. So all the sort of display parts of the on the shell are going through OpenGL. Um, there's, I mean, there's lots more technology there, and if people have questions, I can answer them afterwards, but I think probably at this point you're all sort of ready to see a demo, so uh, we'll go on to the demo at this point. So this is GNOME Shell. Uh, to sort of get continuity with the um, previous slides, I went with the same um, sort of layout as my screenshots. Um, and I think you can see that, I mean, there's some things which have been carried over from GNOME 2 and some things which are very different. Um, so, you know, across the top here, you know, we still have a menu for user actions on the far right, which is something that you'll see in the very recent versions of GNOME 2. We have icons relating to, so I mean, you pop it down, you can, you know, if you want to log out or change your IM status, that's there. We have some icons relating to hardware here, so like your battery power or volume level. We have a calendar, um, so that both, you know, let, lets you see, I had to configure to show me my, my appointments from my Google Calendar or from my cal calendar. Um, and then, you know, we have an indication of running application, that's something that's new. We're actually trying to a little bit more, bring applications a bit more to the forefront, make them you know, less about Windows and a bit more about applications. But I think the most interesting thing here is the activities button on the far left. Um, so one of the things that we're really trying to be, do with um, GNOME 3 is, be, um, is to allow the user to focus on what they're doing. So we really want to make the main view here with, um, about you know, one or two tabs, a very particular subset of what you're doing, and not clutter up with a lot of information about other stuff you could be doing. Because you know, in the modern world, there's always tons of stuff you could be doing. And you know, that's not necessarily something you want right in your face. Um, but on the other hand, you also do need to be able to go and switch to a different task. So activities is about, you know, that switching process. So if I click on activities, we zoom back out. And, you know, you see all your windows that you have open. Um, on the left here is, um, is the dash, which is um, a set of icons representing um, window, uh, both applications that are running and applications that you favorited, that you might want to run. Um, and then, um, I mean, there are various other things that I'll get into later, but that's sort of the basic components here. If I if I clicked on something on the on the dash, you know, if it was a uh, patient that um, wasn't already running a music player, then it would launch it and uh, bring it to the, you know, start start. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I, I think you'll you'll see some stuff popping up in the bottom. This is the messaging area, and we'll um, talk more about it in a second. But or what did, what did I get from my messaging? Oh, I get a message from John here, so. He said, hey, well, you know. <laughs> okay, but, um, you know, if I don't, if I am doing a presentation, of course, I might not have people messaging me so I can um, set myself busy. And when I set myself busy, whatever John says, this is gonna be queued up but not accurately shown. So let's close music player here. Um, 
And then uh, one other thing you'll see in this messaging area is that it also gives you a reminder of what messages you have queued up. So you can see the message tray is shown when you're in there. Yeah. I assume you can turn off the exploding window so that the, the, the screen changes instantaneously? Um, no, not currently. It's, I think the, um, you know, I mean, it's something that we thought that possibly you might need on really slow hardware or, you know, but in general, we want the animations to be fast enough so that they don't get annoying. But and if I can see it, it annoys me. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, I think that's, um, we, we've tried, you know, I, I think um, certainly we, we really want to create something that, you know, does create reactions. So, I mean, we know that everybody's not going to love everything, but we don't necessarily want to have an option for everything that someone might not like. I think, um, you know, that's not, not necessarily a feedback we've gotten a lot if you want to turn it off, but, you know, there are a lot of things people want to do, so, yeah. Um, okay, so, I mean, another thing in the overview is our application launchers, so you can go browse all your applications, and if I wanted to make a favorite, I could, um, <coughs> I don't know if I wanted to scan or something, I could drag it over here, and drop it, and yep. then add my favorites, or I could pick it up and... <coughs> Do scanners work okay these days? Uh, I think it depends a lot on this mm -hmm. the scanner. But I mean, I think it's, you know, it's just, yeah, I, I don't have a scanner, mm -hmm. so I can't order this tape yet. Is it possible to get the icon things just as text and not as... Uh, no, no, no. Uh, is there a question that I haven't showed the icon and text? Uh, not currently, no. I mean, I think the idea basically is that we would have that reading text is fairly slow. So, you know, I think it's more important to be able to show to once you've gotten used to what's in your, your favorites. I mean, well, one thing we try to do is start off with a very small set of favorites. So it's not like we've thrown 80 icons at you that you don't know what they are. We, we I think, default to four different icons in the dash. So hopefully you can go over them and say, okay, these are, this is my web browser, this is that. And then as you choose to pair more things, these are things that you'll have familiarity with. Yeah? yeah? I have to say, I have to vote like way in the other direction for that. Because one, one of the frustrations for me, even with the existing stuff is, you know, I may have four different music players and three or four different programs that I use to talk on my iPod because they all do things a little differently. And if I look at the menus, a lot of the menu options are, you know, this is a program to do this and this, and it doesn't even give you the name of the program. You have no idea what the name of the program is. Um, and this is even worse because it's some, you know, it, let's say you're going to have like, you know, four icons that sort of look like an iPod because it's applications to talk to your, yeah. to talk well, to your user player. Yeah, I mean, our, I, our answer to that really is, say, okay, let's fix one iPod player to work correctly. Because you know we don't necessarily think that we can ask people to try out a bunch of different iPod players and switch between them, one person to, one to do this, one to do that. So I mean, you know, I, I obviously that that is, you know, you know, certainly possible to install a bunch of iPod players, but it's not necessarily what we're primarily targeting. Because you know, I think that, you know, we, you know, so you're purposely dumbing it down. I, I, you know, if you want to say it that way, I mean, the other way of, of saying it is that we're trying to. Um, really streamline the common case. So I mean I think most you know most people I mean I don't think any there the you know there's sort of three groups of people, right? There's a group of people who can't handle more than an iPod player. There's a group of people who can handle it but really would rather not. And then there's people who want to try out all the different iPod connected things and find out which which one works best for which. So we're, I think we're really trying to group, target the first two groups. Yeah. But not necessarily that last group. Well, uh, optimizing it for one use case or even setting that for default is the one thing, but having it so that you can't be a power well, user in this interface. Well, I mean, one thing, you can, I mean, there's all, there's one of the things that's really powerful is that we have text search. So um, if, if you knew the name of the iCloud player you wanted to get, as soon as you were in the overview, you can just start typing. Oh, I see. So if I type Firefox, I'd be to Firefox. So if you had so iCloud like software. Built in, so yeah, so I mean, I think that, you know, that for power users is actually probably a better way of getting a specific iPod player than scanning at the list of text names. So, yeah. If I don't know what one of those icons is, how do I find out? 
Because they do have shows. They do have hovers on yeah. them, so you can texture the right for the Yes, but I mean, this again, as I was saying, that you start off, we, we would expect you not to have a bunch of icons that you just had never seen before. So these are things that you've chosen generally to add to the panel there. So, you know, I mean, sometimes you might have to go searching with the mouse, but hopefully that's not the common case. What, what's the application below Evolution? Below Evolution, that's Rhythm Box. So it's a, it's a speaker. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Obviously, if you go to applications, you know, you know, we have them with names, oh, okay. and there's also you've also even categorized. So, you know, if you want to see graphics, you can narrow it down. Can so, you there, get yeah. that applications list in text only. Uh, no, no text only. Right. I hate this having to scroll through a zillion icons and yeah, well, see the. I mean, I've, I've got the choice. I always turn it into only text. Mm -hmm. But the so we're really trying to. I mean, to I mean, one of the things that making guy kind of really big is to really emphasize their instant beneficial recognition. Once you sort of once you have an idea of what it looks like. So I mean, I think little tiny icons are you know obviously extremely annoying if you have 20 pixels of trying to identify this 20 pixels and that 20 pixels. Our, our hope anyway is here by using quite generously sized icons that. We make it a hopefully a, an experience where you're not generally. I'm staring really good at scanning down the list and finding the thing that I want, and this is not a list that's easy to scan. But, but you, you can. Know the name? You know yeah, the if I know the name. So yeah, our recommendation when you know the name is to just type the first three characters. Well, maybe, maybe I don't name. know the name. Maybe I sort of think I know the name, <laughs> yeah. and that I type in the wrong yeah. thing, and it comes. Yeah. At the same time, you could uh, yeah. once you find it, you can just create a shortcut. You, you should what? you should be able to create a shortcut so to your desktop. Do what? Of the iPod. Yeah, yeah. Shortcut. Yeah, shortcut. Shortcut. Yeah, shortcut. Doesn't that in the end answer the iPod question? I mean, if you have four different programs to run your iPod, can't you just go in the application list, put it on your little taskbar thingy, and then you have all four applications there? Well, I think I think the question was, would four iPod applications have the same icon or very similar icons? But. Yeah, but if if you only, if there's one that you usually use, then yes, you would definitely favor that one, and you wouldn't worry about the other ones. And you yeah. have a question about um, on the Windows screen yeah. when you go back. I saw yeah. two that looked like web links on the bottom. Maybe this is an image, but it showed Google and Wikipedia and two bars on. The oh, when I started searching, yes. Oh. So if I, yeah, you know, if I if I type in GNOME here. Oh. Would just, I mean, we don't, I don't, this is a feature that I don't know if we, we're fully satisfied with yet. The basic idea is that a lot of people, especially really beginning users, don't necessarily distinguish different places of search in the system. So if they go here and type searching, then maybe we should give them a, a bill to do a web search afterwards. But obviously, since it's just a link and not actually showing the results, it's not really that interesting. So. In the back? What happens if you add more favorite icons and you have vertical space going on that one? They just get smaller. Um. So there's no like draws or a second <laughs> draw, draw or anything like that? Um, we, you can get about 30 or so before it gets really <coughs> small, and then at that point, if you have 30, maybe you should just go to the main application view. <laughs> yeah. yeah? The icon title. Is there an easy way to write it back? The icon and title. I mean, which what, what's displayed there? Like simple scan? Yeah. Um, no. So I, I pick the four that are for the iPod and start them with the word iPod. So at least they sort into. Um, and actually, I mean, there is actually this is actually is based upon the old GNOME menu system. So actually, there's a GNOME menu editing tool of a la carte, which you can actually still use and you could use to, to change your desktop files and I think it would work. Mm. But um, you know I think yeah we're we're, we're our certainly our, our hope would be that we can by supporting search and supporting search on any substring and also supporting search on like descriptions, we can make it pretty easy to find to be able to find things without having to do a lot of customization. Yeah. Um, I have a, a classic desktop and now you figures out move on to um, yeah. which is fine because I like this because it seems like it's going to be better for tablets. 
So is it going to be like an on-screen keyboard feature in the future? Yeah, on-screen is uh, one of the top features for 3.2. So this is 3.0. 3.2 is out in the fall, and we're shooting for an on-screen keyboard in 3.2. Oh. So. <coughs> there. so what's the uh, like file browsing story look like? OK, so the file browsing um, story, this is another thing that we're going to work more on 3.2. I mean, in, in 3.0, our basic story is that once it, you know, we're still sort of referring you back to Nautilus for most file functions. So uh, it's one of the four default links is you know the Nautilus files, and you launch that and you, know, you get get the Nautilus file browser. Um, so we basically think of that as an application creating your files. Um, you know, with um, three with three two, we have some plans to really try to get a different view of your files. It doesn't really care too much about where you file the where you put the files. So you know, um, you can say. I'm, you know, let's show me all. You just look, let me look back at the files I've used in the last few days. Um, let me narrow down to PDF files, that type of things. So I think we're in, we're hopefully can handle better the fact that people really don't <coughs> like filing the files. Um, so what about files on separate devices you shown? So like you have a USB stick you stick in. Um, how does that integrate into a system where well, I mean that would file? Okay, so. And that's that's a very interesting question. Certainly, it's something that I think um, I think what we we have to I think we know how it should work. Right? Is that if you stick in this the stick, the files that are on the stick become accessible. But I mean, we're not going to take away the, the the old file browser as well, because sometimes you actually care where a file is. You, I want to move this file to the stick. Sure. That's not really representable in a time view of files. So, you know, the the, the file browser file manager is still going to be there. But it's not going to be necessarily the first place you go to, to deal with your files. So I want to move on here to demo a few more things. Um, so um, another thing we sort of worked on is um, workspaces. So I mean, I think workspaces are a pretty um, familiar part of a Linux desktop. They've been around for quite a while. They've also been something that's really been used almost exclusively by power users. Uh, most. Um, users see workspaces as something that, or their experience with workspaces is there are some strange buttons that they're on the desktop. If they click one, all their windows vanish. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we tried to move to a mode where workspace manipulation was a little more apparent, and also um, where there was a little bit less having to explicitly manage your workspaces. So, when you go to overview, there's this sidebar which shows all your workspaces. So I have right now two workspaces. One workspace, well, one workspace at the top, which is where I've been my slides, and another workspace that I'm been doing the demo in. And then there's always an empty workspace at the bottom. This is a place basically you can put stuff when you want to work on a new workspace. So if I take one of my windows from this workspace and drag it over to here, um, I'm, not, I'm actually hitting some sort of bug here. Okay, so let me, I'm going to do the behind the scenes. Pay no attention to the landmark. Yes. <laughs> I'm really, okay, but right I'm going to go. There you go. Okay. Okay, so. Do you have a drop issue? Yeah, um, my, my, um, what I'm going to blame here is that I have two accounts going on at once. And sometimes that causes some issues with the video drivers, and that can cause weird other issues. But I, you know, it could also be just be demo syndrome. In any case, um, I, if I, dra I dragged it, I launched it over here, and it created through that empty workspace, and then it put it on that workspace and created a new workspace at the bottom. Um, and if I remove everything from workspace, so if I drag this out up here, again, not. Do not drag. Oh, I, I actually know what's going on. That's good. Uh, but it's just that my So that's uh, show us. No. Okay. Any case, <laughs> probably the one who's gonna have to fix it anyway. So. Yeah. <laughs> okay. By the way, that's the one app you need to manage your iPod. So. <laughs> so can I freeze a workspace and recall it later? I've got like 15 applications open in one workspace. Can I take snapshots of that, put it aside like I would like a, let's say, a, like a favorites folder, and then 
bring it back up, let's say three days, four days later, in the exact spit, you know, in the exact frozen sequence where I was. Cool. That's not a current feature, I mean, that's sort of what I think what we think about as a power user feature. And I'll, I'll just mention, take this to mention something that we've been sort of working on, is that obviously, you know, you know, we're sort of trying to make it right out of the box, but we know there are our users who really want to customize their uh, desktop a lot. So one of, one of the things that is, you know, exists but isn't in its final step yet is GNOME Shell extensions. Basically, it's a like a Firefox extension where someone can um, come in and write a JavaScript that drops in and changes some behavior of the shell. So um, people have, you know, done extensions to change the workspace behavior to change the menus, to add a CPU login to the top panel and all that. In some sense, it sort of all horrifies us because we know how it's supposed to be and somebody is changing it, but we also, you know, think it's, you know, want to put the control in the user's hands. And so, I mean, I think that's, you know, where we eventually see the kind of um, sort of, you know, power, you know. You're going to have to show loading costs now. That's until you yeah. have to spend that much. Well, <laughs> no? right. well, we can. Yeah, this is what we already sh I've already shown you one of the magic commands. Yeah. The start command, I'll show you the other one, which is the console command. So if you type LG, it brings down a, 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 a console where you can evaluate JavaScript expressions and modify elements of your desktop. So what's what's written in JavaScript? Is the whole uh, shell written in JavaScript? The whole shell is written in JavaScript. What was it before? Uh, with, with GNOME. Um, basically, um, straight C for... So that's kind of a change, huh? Yeah, it's kind of a change. Oh. <laughs> I general, happy not to be at... Um, Funding malice crashes. Yeah. Uh, is gesture support something that would be built into this interface, or is it more an operating system level feature? Um, I think it's, um, you know, it's something. I mean, people mean a lot of different things by gesture support, but I mean, I mean, sometimes it's just like it's an application mode, like you know, zooming on the web. Sometimes you know, it's thing. It's often application specific, really, integration of gestures. So, as something that's application specific. Um, that's something that, you know, the question of how do you get the gesture from the hardware to the application. And so, I mean, Canonical has done some work on that, that seems sort of refined in that community to have a standard way of putting that is happening. If we had gestures that really applied to the entire desktop, then that would be something that could own shell with So if you had gesture to close for an application or something, they could just. Yeah. So um, I think actually. Uh, you saw it slide down, but I think we'll, um, so first I was just to say a little bit more about, well, mm -hmm. of, um, so we, we, we saw, you know, the direction with the message tray at the bottom there where you can go and um, messages come from the bottom, you can go back and get to your old messages. We have this inline chat feature, which I think is pretty cool. You saw I was able to, to chat back with John without having to open a chat application. This is one of the things where I was saying where um, if you, um, where I was saying that, you know, we want to bring this up that's really urgent to you when it's urgent, but allow you to also ignore it so that you don't have to chat with the person. You can just let that message just slide back down and deal with it on your own terms. Um, but I think the last thing we'll really show off here is um, some of busy. I'm not no longer busy. So. <laughs> Does it have empathy running? Um, <coughs> I feel empathy running. Let's see what I said there. Should I just do system settings? Well, why don't you do system settings and we'll. Okay. So. so, this is just drink just coffee and he drinks uh, Pepsi. Yeah. So, drink we'll. Coffee. <laughs> so, well, but you know, so obviously one of the things we also did was we wanted to integrate with other parts of GNOME outside of GNOME Shell, so we wanted to show off a little bit of work that was done on a different part of the GNOME interface, which is our system settings. And that since John did most of this, I'll let him talk about it. Okay, I'll try to be real brief. I know everyone's thirsty. So, um, okay. we talked a bit about how we're trying to make this coherent experience and integrate the entire operating system. And one way we've been doing, trying to do that, and it's still ongoing, is this new thing we call system settings. You may remember in GNOME 2 there was a preferences menu and you had a variety of options in there. 
Um, but we have a number of brand new things in GNOME 3. Um, things are sort of surprising that we never had before. Um, we never had this in GNOME. We never had a way to create user accounts, manipulate user accounts, set up guest accounts, and change your login options and password. That never existed. That's brand new. Um, a couple other, I'll just show you that really quickly. And it's sort of just what you'd expect, right? You change, you can change your name, you can add users, change your password, set auto login, stuff like that. Um, and I can't, I don't know his password as it turns out, but um, we also have the ability for administrators to sort of lock these things down in this nicely integrated password protect, protection dialog. Um, allows you to unlock, unlock the panel and make changes. Another brand new thing, believe it or not, is the ability to change your time zone, time, and date. That wasn't in GNOME before. It's pretty weird. Yeah. Um, Built-in NTP support. Um, pretty, pretty map and whatnot. Can you change the date format? Sorry. Can you change the date format? Can that be on your region specific? Yeah, we we try to pick that stuff up from, from the locale. Um, the plans for that, although incomplete, is to have the time, date, money formats in your region and language. Um, that hasn't been finished. That's probably three. So you have to choose some place that has the format that you want. You can't just set the format for what you want. No, that would, you would there was a there, in the mockups anyway. This hasn't been implemented yet. We have the ability to customize it's your okay. um, LC, what is it, LC date, LC time, yeah. your locale time, and that we use that in the clock automatically. <coughs> so are these just GUIs for like all the underlying distribution specific? See that's that the cool part. To? No, they're not. They're brand new and they're designed to just work with, with in some cases new new subsystems that we've written to support them. So you guys are running your own NTP client inside NTP actually just sometimes? just turns on the NTP daemon. Okay. I mean so when there's something sitting when there is um, something that's already there that worked well, we, we were just using that, and that's probably applies to most things. But what, what we're generally not trying to do is create abstraction layers. Say we're going to work with this NTP one and this NTP one and this NTP one because that's a lot of effort for. Right. Like for example, we have a printer. There are no printers in the room, as it turns out. Um, but this uses cups, so we didn't rewrite a printing subsystem. We're using cups, but we've you know using the CUPS APIs to talk to it. We're not talking to some distro scripts <coughs> or anything like that. Um, yeah, we never had that before. So that's that's brand new. And you know, we have nice, pretty backgrounds. And, and the normal things you'd expect from a controller. Possible to add your own? Yep. Yep. And it picks, it picks them up from your pictures folder by the ball. <laughs> I didn't like that. <laughs> um, and let's see what else did I want to mention. Here. And another big improvement here is that we actually have built-in network configuration. That wasn't in known before, believe it or not. So these are all things you expect from a, from a first class operating system. So then, yeah. So I have a whole bunch of these people that are not in dev and, op, uh, dev and ops basically. Mm -hmm. How successful are they with this? So Everybody that's basically not in this room that you have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis and take up lots of your time. How much time does this alleviate? You know, how more, how much more successful are people that aren't them or ops? I think that's what, so. Like what I was talking about before, I think we're trying to reach those people with this. And there's, they're actually so um, you, you haven't quantified that though. So I mean, have you gone out to those communities outside of those that you've engaged for the mockups and those things and see what these performances are gained? You know, in terms of you know, you see a you know fifty percent increase over you know the previous not, edition. Not statistically like that. Um, these are I mean, we've all I I worked with with that um, in that field for a long time, so a lot of us have. 
we, we know that there's a, a lot of problems people have with existing Linux-based systems. There's a lot of complexity, a lot of concepts they just simply don't understand. Yeah, because I mean, if I want to sell my organization on, on moving off of, let's say, the Apple platform or off of the Windows platform and onto a Linux platform, having that sells it more than any one feature that's yeah. in here. Yeah. Um, another thing that you know has been a strong uh, selling point of GNOME over the even since GNOME 2 is ability to lock things down. So what you're seeing here is like what we'd expect um, you to use in, in somebody who has a laptop. But if you want to deploy it in a managed system, there's like a lot more we can do behind the scenes to turn different features off. You saw one where the time and date was locked down a little bit. You can actually also just turn that off. And there's various forms of lockdown that we have. So as an administrator, you can you know, prevent problems ahead of time by saying, this is off limits. But so that is definitely something that we're hoping. So, uh, what, what, what are you using now to uh, 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 prototype? What, what are you doing? Is it me? How do what? I prototype things? Yeah, yeah. I mean, what, 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 what you're showing is that, the, is that is that not like the latest version of Mint? Uh, it kind of looks like the. Uh, 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 I mean, what what distros currently have uh, 3.0 and and one of the more stable states? In order to um, look at this it. is this is Fedora 15 beta. Okay. Um, OpenSUSE is also <coughs> shipping GNOME 3 mm -hmm. in there. Some, some yeah. sort of. Some yeah, I mean, so I mean, yeah, it will be shipped in the OpenSUSE that's coming out. Like I guess it's some. Um, yeah, Jewish. Yeah, but um, yeah, I mean, generally, I mean, Fedora is a pretty good place to start because um, you know, the bunch of us working on GNOME 3, you also do development on Fedora, so. But, um, but there's actually, I mean, there's a lot of different distributions that you do have for GNOME 3, and I can't just them off right here. So yeah, th so this is, uh, I think we're out of time, you're, you're 30 already. Um, this is GNOME 3. Um, we're actually well on our way to towards 3.2 already, believe it or not. This came out um, earlier this month. We have a lot of cool things coming up in 3.2 as well. Yeah. Um, so, so when Fedora uh, 15 uh, currently comes stable at the end of uh, May, uh, uh, they will have the same sort of thing like you, you can, uh, uh, if you uh, want to be the best of all worlds, you can have uh, uh, kind of like by, by saying sessions switch, you, you know, uh, look at KD4 and look at GNOME 3. Yeah, that's what you want to do. Yeah. I would recommend you try this one. <laughs> <laughs> What's the development environment like? Is it what kind of IDEs do you have, or is it just command line development? I mean, there are I mean, different people use different things. Um, I'd say that we generally, um, um, I say most of us are pretty old school, so we stick to Emacs and the command line. Um, and I think one of the nice things with this um, Java CSS is it's not a lot of big compilation pro process. So generally, what we work is we just, you know, you have a text editor opening on a file, you make some changes, you restart the shell, and the, and the changes are there. So it doesn't necessarily really need a very complicated ID. So, so the interfaces for developing the GUI is the CSS? Yes. Yeah. So, okay. I mean, there's obviously a lot of very cool things we could do given a lot of time, you know, like live editing the CSS or whatever, but, you know, I, th I think it's generally it's a very, you know, Pretty simple thing to work on, and we haven't found a need for complex IDs. But there are, you know, so we have haven't really tried to like pull up the stuff or anything. But it would be possible if you were wanting to work on that. Uh, One more question: are, are you guys supporting theming? Um, you know, we're not we're, we're not supporting theming. We sort of have basic extensions, and that's something that I think some people will really want to do, and we want to provide some more to it. But unlike <coughs> Theming actually generates a lot of problems with application developers because you know they want to make the application look really good to fit into the system, and then suddenly this is, if you, you don't do like look anything, how do you do that? I mean, how if there's all the stuff in the, the system has wood backgrounds, you have to make your own application have wood backgrounds. So I mean, I think we're we sort of seen that you know we really want to have an identity for GNOME and a pretty standard look so that people can really fine tune that and get it right. And that's really more important than allowing 50 or 100 different themes. So right now we're sort of de-emphasizing theming, but 
you know, there are some people out there who really want to do gaming, so it's only not going to be, you know, they'll make it happen, it, you know, whether we're hunting on it or not. Can, yeah. can you at least change the color of things, though? Um, I, I, I guess, like, like some things, like the fact that the title bar is the same color as the background, there's no distinct thing, like, like clicking on the title bar does something, but you can't even see where the title bar is. And the menu line, yeah. Well, I mean, our, our goal there is to get the clicking on the part of the menu with, and that's new things from the title bar, just the same thing as clicking on the, yeah, on the menu the title bar, but maybe it works out. It yeah. works. Yeah, so, another thing we didn't show is some of the gestures. Like, your mouse is really messed up. Yeah, I don't know. That's, I'm glad I was playing. I don't know what's going on. But yeah, if you've used um, if you've used Windows Seven, we all we just stole their Windows Snap feature because <laughs> it's pretty cool. Um, yeah, there's the side by side snap. Um, another thing, if if you want to maximize, you just drag to the top. Same thing. Um, but I was going to show that yeah, you can actually drag from anywhere that's gray at the top not just the title bar. And that's something that, as you rightly pointed out, that you kind of need that if you're going to make them visually indistinct. Anyway, I think yeah, yeah. Well so I mean, anybody I mean, can call up and ask questions the person, I think. But any free expo passes to your convention? Sorry? There, are there any free expo passes to your convention? We don't, we don't even get free expo passes to <laughs> <laughs> I don't have any. I'm not sure. No, but yeah. are, are there any vendor or anything? Oh, vendor? I, 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 I don't really know the answer to that. I expect, yeah, I just don't know. Okay, thank you guys.